Congressman Paul Riddick, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance of the Flag. Heavenly Father, we come to you this evening as humbly as we know how, thanking you for all the blessings you bestow upon us as a city. We ask you to continue to bless our residents. Bless the young people in our community to keep them safe, keep them steadfast in regards to learning. We ask you to give us the ability to do this job in a fair and just manner. These and all the blessings we ask in that name. Amen. Amen. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Burford? Here. Mr. Protegiru? Here. Mr. Riddick? Here. Mr. Smeagol? Here. Dr. Wibley? Here. Mr. Wynn? Here. The motion is to excuse Mayor Paul Frame. Mr. Burford? Aye. Mr. Protegiru? Aye. Mr. Riddick? No. I vote aye. <laughs> <laughs> I almost recorded that. Mr. Smeagol? Aye. Dr. Wibley? Aye. Mr. Wynn? Aye. The, the motion is dispensed with the reading of the minutes from the previous meeting. Mr. Burford? Aye. Mr. Protegiru? Aye. Mr. Riddick? Aye. Mr. Smeagol? Aye. Dr. Wibley? Aye. Mr. Wynn? Aye. The clerk will read the resolution from the closed meeting. A resolution certifying a closed meeting of the Council of the City of Norfolk held in accordance with the provisions of the Virginia Freedom of Information Act. Adopt the resolution. Mr. Burford? Aye. Mr. Protegiru? Aye. Mr. Riddick? Aye. Mr. Smeagol? Aye. Dr. Wibley? Aye. Mr. Wynn? Aye. I even know. Good evening, and welcome to the Norfolk City Council Chambers. For the benefit of those who do not normally attend Norfolk City Council meetings, the way in which we conduct our business is as follows. Tonight we have, well, we normally take up all ceremonial matters first, and then we, tonight we have a uh, bid, and so we will deal with that. Then we move uh, to our public hearings, and we will vote on them as they appear on the docket. And tonight we have four. Then we move directly to our consent agenda, and we vote on these items uh, the way that they appear, unless we have a council person who wished to have one of these items uh, 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 taken up separately. Then we move directly to our regular agenda item, and then we vote on these items in which the way that they appear. Uh, if those of you who uh, had an opportunity to fill out a slip of paper uh, before you uh, 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 came into the ch chambers this evening before 7 o'clock. We'll have the opportunity to speak. Um, that is the way we can uh, duck our business. And we will start with uh, our cer ceremonial matter. And our ceremonial matter this evening, we have, uh, Chris we have uh, Norfolk Christian School Girls Basketball Team. Uh, All right. Do you stand? Okay. They won the Virginia Independent School Athletic Association Division II State Basketball Championship. And we have with us uh, Coach Curtis Turner. We have Headmaster James uh, Duffy and the Principal Kay Patel. <laughs> you come up to the mic. We, we have a resolution for you that I will read. Uh, and it says, whereas Norfolk Christian School Athletic Program seeks to instill in students the importance of achieving and maintaining good health while teaching the valuable lesson of teamwork, sportsmanship, friendly competition, and leadership. And whereas Norfolk Christian Ambassadors Girls Basketball Team has established itself as a Division II powerhouse in the Virginia Independent right. Schools Athletic Association. And whereas in a remarkable 2012 2013 season, the Norfolk Christian girls advanced to the state tournament at Wakefield School where the Lady Ambassadors eliminated top seed at Miller School on March 1st to advance to the finals against William Williamsburg Christian. And whereas averaging a regular season loss to Williamsburg, the Lady Ambassadors capped and, and, and uh, excuse me, in, uh, uh, <laughs> improbable tournament run with a hard-fought 36-31 victory over Williamsburg Christian uh, on March 2nd to win the Virginia Independent Schools Athletic Association Division II Girls Basketball Championship. 
Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Council of the City of Norfolk does hereby extend hearty congratulations to Coach Curtis Turner and the Norfolk Christian Girls basketball team on an occasion of, for this outstanding achievement. Thank you, Coach. You come up, please. Thank you. All right. If you want to make a few remarks, you can. First of all, I want to thank God for <clears throat> without him, we are no one. And I just want to say, you know, thank you, Councilman, Vice Mayor, Councilwomen, for letting us attend this today. This is a very important moment for my girls and our school. Um, when no one thought we could do it, we were, we did. It was like the little engine that could. We just kept going and going and going. So I just want to say, you know, to everyone here, especially my headmaster, my principal, all the great parents I have, especially my young ladies right here, my baby girl, stand up. And my trainers, come on, y'all stand up because they did every, they were there at 5.30 morning practices also. I just want to say thank you. And girls, job well done. Thank you. Take a few pictures. Okay. Uh, the girls want to come right around the front, or do we want them? Yeah, let's go. Yeah, let's come right around the front. We'll squeeze in here. They want like tail straight out. We don't need those hurt on that. We can squeeze on in. That don't work. James and Mike, I could do nothing on them. Nothing. Hey, Bernard, we don't have to vote on that, do we? Yes. Uh, yeah, that we ought to. Yes. Okay. So resolution. Okay. Here, you need to stand here. <laughs> Marcus, come on. John. That's great. Again, again, we're so proud of you young ladies. Uh, continue to do good, good things in school with your studies. And uh, hopefully we'll see you back here next year with another championship. All right. Uh, we got a pretty lengthy docket, and I, we, oh, you got some time to... We need to vote it. on this, so we're, we're before they leave, yeah. 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 let's vote on it very quickly. Mr. Clerk? Ready to call the, call the vote, Mr. Mr. President? Yes. Adopt the resolution, Mr. Burfitt. Aye. Mr. Protegiru. Well, if I could just say, I think I'm wearing my Norfolk Christian purple and gold today, am I not? <laughs> um, but I will say this, uh, uh, as tied as I am to Norfolk Collegiate, uh, as many of you know, uh, you know when I, when I, I don't, can I amend the word powerhouse uh, out of the, uh, uh, <laughs> that being said, congratulations. You guys have done great. Uh, I am very proud of Norfolk Christian, a wonderful independent school in our city. Uh, you've done a great job with your athletics. You've done a great job with your academics. Uh, I'm proud of your wrestling team. Uh, you've done a terrific job, and uh, just uh, just keep it up. Uh, just uh, remember when you play the Oaks, you may have to let it up a little bit. But very proud of you guys. Good job. Aye. Mr. Riddick? Aye. Mr. Smigel? Aye. Dr. Wibley? Well, I would just like to say a couple of years ago, we had the men up here, and you guys certainly outshone them. Much better looking. <laughs> Aye. Ms. Williams? Um, I'd like to say to the girls, to the young ladies, um, good job and well done. And I would also like to say I'm really, it was really, I, I didn't know what um, one of my former classmates was here for tonight. Your coach, um, Curtis Turner, is one of my former classmates. And so when I walked in and saw him, I was like, Okay, what's he here for? Um, but it's really good to see uh, individuals, as you all get older, um, you will find that individuals that you went to school with will do other things, and some of them not so good things, and uh, some of them really good things. And so it's really nice to see individuals that you went to school with doing really well. And so um, to Coach Turner, um, I'm very proud of you, and I'm very proud to know you. Um, he was a great basketball player when we went to school together, and um, I see that it rubbed off in being a good coach. Aye. Mr. Wynn? Aye. Okay, we have a invitation uh, to bid. Yes, sir. You may want to excuse me. Well, I've let them leave and let them clear out. We get that ready. 
Take the part. Okay, Mr. President. Um, yes, sir. Um, we have tonight an invitation to bid uh, that was scheduled for this day pursuant to action of council on February 26, 2013, and public notice having been inserted in the local press by the city clerk to accept a bid for a 20-foot non-exclusive easement for ingress and egress across the southeast corner of Harbor Park, parking lot D, for a term of 40 years. Okay. How many bids have we have been received? One bid has been received. Please read, the, please read the bid that has been received, please. Uh, Norfolk Southern Railway Company has submitted a bid in which they offer in exchange for the 20-foot ingress and egress easement uh, over city-owned property east of Harbor Park to grant the city a 40-year non-exclusive easement upon and across Norfolk Southern Railway Company land for construction, maintenance, use, and removal of a vehicular public access entryway over, across, and upon Norfolk Southern Railway Company land near the city's Harbor Park and it's been marked for identification as NS bid 32613. Okay. Are there any other bids? No, sir. All right. I declare the bid uh, bidding closed. Um, is there any member of the public who wishes to speak or be heard as it relates to this issue? Okay. I declare the public hearing closed, Mr. Clerk. Um, is there any recommendation from uh, city staff regarding the bid received by Norfolk Southern Railroad Company? Yes, sir. Staff recommends the bid by Norfolk Southern Railway be accepted and the 20-foot non-exclusive easement for ingress and egress for the 40-year term be awarded to Norfolk Southern Railway Company. Okay, Mr. Manager. And I have an ordinance for that, Mr. President. Please read it. The ordinance is captioned, an ordinance accepting the bid submitted by Norfolk Southern Railway Company and granting said company a 20-foot non-exclusive 40-year easement for ingress and egress over certain city-owned property located east of Harbor Park, subject to certain terms and conditions. Dispense with the charter requirement for reading the ordinance and adopt. Mr. Burfitt? Aye. Mr. Protegiro? Aye. Mr. Riddick? Aye. Mr. Smeagle? Aye. Dr. Wibley? Aye. Ms. Williams? Aye. Mr. Wynn? Aye. Ms. Lyons? Okay, public hearing one. Public hearing one scheduled for this day pursuant to action of council on February 26, 2013. Public notice having been inserted in the local press on the application of the City Planning Commission to adopt Plan Norfolk 2030 as the city's new comprehensive plan and repeal the general plan of Norfolk 1992 as amended by a 6-0 vote. Planning Commission recommends uh, the request be approved with amendments. So we have a number of individuals signed up to speak. Peter Quas. Before we... Have the people speak talk speak to the amendments that are going to be included in this. Uh, I think it could save a lot of. Uh, we yeah. Yeah, well, let, let's do let's do that. that let's start of doing it out. Recognize it's part of the Frank. plan. Yeah, Frank would spell them out so that yeah. uh, there were some concerns within the council on some of the items, and we have amended them to try to, I guess, address those. And well, Frank, if I may, uh, Mr. Pishko, is it proper that uh, that we've uh, those of us who have amendments that we wish to bring forward, bring those forward first, and then have um, um, Frank, uh, Mr. Duke, uh, uh, then comment upon those, or should he comment first, and then we make the amendment? Uh, it's your discretion, but I think it might be most efficient if Mr. Duke went first. He might have all of that you have, and if there are additional, it might be more efficient to take them up after. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> And I'm just as good with Frank as Mr. Duke, <laughs> Council Member Protégé. You are. You are, Frank. Um, the amendments that Council had asked for, the first one I will mention is a request to include a chapter on lifelong learning. Uh, this was not in the original um, series of chapters that were proposed to the Planning Commission, um, but it was because this is a Council priority to improve learning opportunities throughout all aspects of life, beginning with pre-K on up through adult education and include all of the Norfolk public schools and the private schools um, to address all of those issues and to recognize that that is a priority of council. Council asked us to develop a chapter dealing with lifelong learning. That chapter has been added or has been developed. I can't say it's added because you have to take that action tonight. 
Um, that chapter has been developed. It was reviewed by the Planning Commission, which has recommended its approval and inclusion in the general plan, although they did not have a public hearing on it. Uh, the chapter does simply pull out of the other elements of Plan Norfolk 2030, those provisions that were specific to lifelong learning, as well as look at some of the actions that uh, the City Council uh, has staff currently undertaking to promote uh, educational opportunity through all aspects of life. And staff would recommend that that be included in the plan. The second series of amendments that you have are some additional revisions to the Greater Norview Area Plan. Uh, these amendments are designed to reflect some of the issues that have emerged through the task force for that area over the past few years, dealing with implementation of the streetscape plan and land assembly uh, in order to create better opportunities for commercial development. Um, we have worked with the city manager's office as well as representatives of the Department of Development and communications with the neighborhood development specialist on this section of the plan. And so we would also recommend that that be added to the plan. The third area is an issue that emerged very late. And that I think is an issue that has created a great deal of consternation from the boating community because there is a policy currently in the plan that calls for the city to move to designate uh, no discharge zones in our rivers. And we, I personally felt that that was probably not exactly what the Planning Commission had originally intended because one of the things that they have stressed is throughout this, this project of the plan is working with community partners. So what we have proposed to you is language that working with the affected community, that would be the boaters and the marinas in the city, we would explore the opportunities uh, to seek designation of some of the waterways as no discharge zones. And we believe that will alleviate some of the concerns that we've heard over the past couple of weeks that we are moving to do something without involving the community. And the last issue is a request from the Gent Neighborhood League to change the designation, land use designation of Yarmouth Street uh, in Ghent. It is currently shown on your land use plan as mixed residential and that reflects the idea that, or the fact that this particular street consists of a mix of single family as well as townhome units. Um, the Ghent Neighborhood League had requested that the street be designated as urban residential. We could not support that because the majority of the units on the street are in fact townhome units. So we would be recommending that that street be, be changed to a multifamily corridor, which would reflect that the majority of the units are townhomes, if that be the will of council. Uh, thank you, Frank. Is there a difference between a townhome and a row house? No, sir. No. The, the idea, Andy, is that those homes right now are, although individually owned, are in the townhouse corridor. And if something happened and they were destroyed, if they um, that were to happen, the only thing that could be rebuilt would be what what it looks like now. Right. I was trying to even make it more restrictive, frankly. That's what I was asking. I, I don't have a way to make it more restrictive if you went with the if single. It's pretty much the same. Uh, well, yeah. our, our resident expert let us know. Okay. If you went with the um, urban residential, then you've got an issue that the townhomes, if they were destroyed, would have a problem. But by going with the corridor, um, you're accommodating both. And they seek the amendment. That's what that was a request. I, I haven't spoken to anyone from Ghent. I sent an email uh, to the president of the Ghent Neighborhood League, but I have not had any response okay. on that issue. Is that what they said? Well, I think it's a, a compromise that I personally can live with. Okay. Thank you, Frank. Can I ask a question? Yes, please, President. Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Duke, in regards to the no discharge zone, we're talking about waste from boats? Yes, sir. And, okay. Now, are there any federal or state guidelines that already? We don't have anything in place right now. This was an issue that came up through the development of the plan from some of the environmental groups as well as uh, the city's stormwater staff and public works because we know that we are going to have to be meeting the uh, TMDL the total maximum daily loading standards uh, for the Clean Water Act. Yeah. And one of the concerns is this might be a way to help achieve that. Okay. But I, I don't know that anyone intended we would rush into this and, and designate these uh, any water bodies as no discharge zones. I think the issue is we've got to look at what are all of the things that contribute to pollutant loading and then regulate based on that. Mm -hmm. So the boaters are resisting 
some of the marinas had expressed concern that they don't have space to deal with all the pump out facilities that might be needed, that we really needed to do more outreach mm -hmm. um, before we went forward. And I think they were reading this, that we were gonna ask council to designate them tomorrow. That was not our intent. And I don't believe that was the planning commission's intent. Because yet. two or three times last season, if I'm not mistaken, portions of Ocean View were closed. Yes, sir. Uh, because of um, environmental uh, problems. Uh, I don't, <clears throat> personally, I don't think they should be able to do any discharges anywhere within, you know, that the, that bathers would come in contact with or could spill into drinking water. So I would hope we wouldn't, you know, give in to boaters. You know, I have one of my best friends is a boater, but I, w I hope we would not give in, you know, to boaters and we'd be more concerned about the bathers uh, that we have uh, in our beaches during the summer and also our water. And, and I would share your concern that we, we really have to be focused on improving the quality of our waters, but, we, but I still do believe that our obligation is to try to work with the community and ascertain uh, exactly what are the causes of the pollutant loads that we're seeing, right. which is why I would recommend the modification to work with the community and explore that as an option instead of... So what would happen in the meantime? They'd just be able to spill and have to get rid of no, sir, they're, they're still going to be bound by whatever regulations that are currently in place. Right. But the issue would be that, that we would be looking for a heightened level uh, if that is the answer to addressing water quality issues. Thank you. Okay, Peter uh, Scott Chirino. While he's coming up, uh, Mr. Pishko, can we vote on those as a block recommendation for an amendment to it? Is it has to be a motion from one of us. Can we move for it to be voted on as a block? Uh, y yes. Uh, okay. Yes. Sir. Or is it just going to be included if we ask to be included in the overall plan before we vote on the plan? That what I had thought was that the uh, plan with these amendments would be voted on at, uh, at once. Once, okay. But like with the consent, if there's a desire to separate something okay. out, you certainly can. Okay, thank you. Please state your name, your full address. We have three minutes. Hi, my name is Peter Squeecherini. I live at 5219 Rolf Avenue up near ODU at the Larchmont Edgewater Subdivision. <coughs> and uh, thank you very much for your time and service. I am here to make comments about the no discharge zone that we have just heard. Uh, the clarification should first be made. There is no discharge of any untreated or raw sewage from any boats uh, because of the Clean Water Act 1972. Federal and Coast Guard approved marine sanitation devices, they're known as type 1 and type 2, treat the uh, effluent to a level, a reduced level of uh, the microbes that we're all concerned about and are currently in accordance with federal uh, standards. Now, the no discharge zone, yes, it would have impact on the boating community. My ties here are I'm an avid boater. I keep my boat up in uh, on uh, Lafayette River, and I do pay property taxes on it. Uh, I also come from the commercial marine industry. I've worked in this port as a commercial mariner in the tug and barge business. There are many tugs out there, commercial fishing vessels, head boats, you're all aware of that. The impact of a no discharge zone requiring them to hold all effluent that currently is in accordance with federal standards will impose serious economic hardship on those tugs, those fishing vessels, and other commercial traffic in this working port and cause operational issues for pumping them out. So currently there is no pollution of raw sewage. The uh, re reference by Mr. Duke to uh, the relative scale of the problem is uh, quite uh, apt. Right now, 99% of all the microbial pollutants that enter our waters come from runoff, pet waste, and wildlife waste. Less than 1%, the others, contain boaters. So boating contributes less than 1% of any of the microbial loading. And there are federal standards, type 1 and type 2 uh, heads, that boaters are complying with, and to impose that hardship, which would be both economic 
and, in, uh, and operational enjoyment of their boats and the commercial traffic at this time is, uh, I feel, unreasonable and like Mr. Duke, should be set to a goal of uh, outreach to the community. Last Monday, Last Monday, there was a meeting with the Elizabeth River uh, Association, which was tremendous, and the U vast uh, consensus was to go with the U a, uh, outreach to the boaters and the commercial community and not at this time do a no-discharge zone until there is a better handle on the other 99% of the discharge going on. Thank you. But I do want to assure you, no raw sewage is going in, Mr. Riddick. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. James, oh, excuse me, James O'Brien. Good evening. I'm James O'Brien. I live at 520 Talbot Hall Road in Norfolk. And I'm here representing the Talbot Hall Foundation. I first want to thank all those who participated in the creation of Plan Norfolk 2030, particularly Chapter 10, Preserving Our Heritage. This chapter states that Norfolk has a long and rich history that is reflected in its architecture and cultural resources. While much has been lost due to urban renewal and commercial development, some very significant historic resources still remain in Norfolk. One of those is Talbot Hall. Talbot Hall is a 200-year-old plantation house located in the Talbot Park neighborhood. It is one of only a handful of early 19th century plantation homes left in Norfolk, and the only one with most of its original yard intact. Purchased in 1774 with the house constructed in 1800, it was owned by the Talbot family until 1954, when the family gave the property to the Episcopal Diocese of Southern Virginia which has preserved the property ever since. It is on the banks of the Lafayette River, which itself is undergoing restoration. It has been found eligible for listing in the National Register of Historic Places by the Virginia Department of Historic Resources, and it was the site of a Confederate encampment in 1861 and 1862. The Episcopal Diocese has determined that it will sell Talbot Hall. The diocese, which has been a good steward, has made it clear in public messages and in private comments that it hopes to be able to sell the property in a way that will preserve the house and yard. There are concerns in the community, however, that the integrity of this landmark could be at risk. For example, some of the land could be sold to generate cash even if the house is preserved. The property has not yet been put on the market, but it is likely that it will be sometime this year, perhaps even this summer. The property is presently zoned institutional, has been appraised in recent years by the city at about $3.7 million. The Talbot Hall Foundation was formed to serve as a community catalyst and holder of funds with the goal of preserving Talbot Hall. We are actively working to build a widely representative community coalition to ensure that Talbot Hall and its land is protected and preserved. We bring this matter to the attention of City Council because Plan Norfolk 2030 calls for the preservation of sites like Talbot Hall. The plan calls for an increased number of historic resources, including structures that are not necessarily located within a larger historic district. Local landmark designation would create a method for such buildings to be recognized and offered local protection. Plan Norfolk 2030 calls for a revision of the zoning ordinance to provide for designation of local landmarks. We urge the council and city staff to take a look at Talbot Hall. Consider the many ways that it could enrich the cultural life of the city and find ways to help the community to preserve it for now and for future generations. Thank you. Thank you. Ellis James. Thank you, Mr. Vice Mayor, members of council, Mr. Jones. My name is Ellis W. James. I'm a lifelong resident of Norfolk. And I want to address specifically the question that has suddenly appeared on the radar screen. No discharge zones. I'd like to read you a comment from the general plan 
No discharge zones or water bodies into which the discharge of sewage from all vessels is completely prohibited. This designation assigned by the Environmental Protection Agency must be applied for by the state following determination that the body of water requires greater protection than current federal standards allow. Further comment, under the encourage all marinas in Norfolk to seek, to seek designation as Virginia Clean Marinas, the intent of Virginia Clean Marina program is to provide technical assistance and educate marina operators and boaters on ways to maintain water quality and protect living resources by addressing issues such as unchecked stormwater runoff, drips from fuel docks, discharges from marine heads, and fish waste. Marinas that adequately address these issues are identified as Virginia Clean Marinas. There are 10 clean marinas in the city of Norfolk already. I have heard no great outcry of economic deprivation, and I would simply call your attention to the fact that every single waterway in the city of Norfolk is impaired. My friends, the boaters, no one's aiming at the responsible boaters. What we're trying to do is to leave our children and our grandchildren waterways that address the issue of quality of life and clean waters for the city of Norfolk. I would urge you not to change the language. This puts us on record as a city, and it was duly noted by Mr. Riddick just a few moments ago. Thank you, Mr. Riddick. Um, I would urge that we keep this language because it addresses the real issue in this revision of the comprehensive plan. Norfolk's waterways are all impaired by lots of different things. And so the city needs to go on record, and the staff has done an excellent job. There were plenty of hearings and input, and I really somewhat take offense at the last minute sudden appearance of great concern. Where were these folks when we held the town hall meetings, the informational meetings, and so on? I wish they had come and shared their concerns then. Thank you, Ellis. Thank you. Alton Robinson. Good evening, uh, Vice Mayor Burke, Council. Uh, my name is Alton Robinson. My address is uh, 735 West 35th Street. My daughter's asked to come up here with me. I wouldn't refuse. Hmm. Um, I, I'm here to speak on the uh, plan Norfolk 2030. This plan is a fine group of encouraging, politically swollen words, which to some people don't amount to a hill of beans. Let me explain what I mean. Take, for example, outcome N2.4 on page 8 of chapter 3, Title, Neighborhoods of Choice that Embrace People from the, a Diversity of Incomes and Ethnicities. Well, we don't see much ethnic diversity in the projects of NRHA with 98% poor blacks, nor are they a neighborhood of choice because if the people living there had a choice, they would probably move. Also, look at Action N 2.4.3 on the same page, which states, support the efforts of the creative class as they work to enhance the vibrancy of Norfolk's neighborhoods, then there are comments which states and define creative class is a term used to describe workers in science, engineering, education, computer programming, research, the arts, design, and media. Who created the creative class? Sure wasn't the poor class because the poor has to attend class at the Norfolk Public Schools. This plan discriminates and it is biased. Let me explain. There's another section in the plan, chapter 10, titled Preserving Our Heritage. Yes, my tax dollars are used to preserve their heritage, but not the heritage of my people, but it is called ours. The history of my people and the heritage of my people have been destroyed because of racial discrimination, 
and cultural discrimination. The, the city has a history of racial discrimination, which continues to this present day, but under the disguise of culture. Some leadership of this city is wise enough to know that racial discrimination is against the law. However, it is not against the law to culturally discriminate or to be culturally biased. This plan talks about history and culture. The plan expresses concerns for the Harrison Opera House, Chrysler Hall, the Chrysler Museum, home to a world-renowned glass collection. Who cultures that? Not mine, but my tax dollars are being spent on those cultures, which are not my culture. That's, culture, that's being culturally biased. Norfolk is historically rich, and history is being preserved, but not my history. For example, the city tore down the first accredited black high school in the South, John T. West, which had one black graduating high school class of 1915, and the school administration claims to have no record of the names of that graduating class. Do not spend my tax dollars on this plan if I'm not to be included in the Norfolk Plan 2030. Let me explain. As an example, a person can say, I am black. I live, work, and raise my family in the city of Norfolk. I buy all my goods in the city of Norfolk. I pay taxes in the city of Norfolk, which makes me a taxpayer. I live in Carrier Park. My neighborhood is not mentioned in the plan Norfolk 2030. According to the plan in Chapter 12 under the implementation, the Norfolk neighborhood goal number one is to enable neighborhood residents to keep ownership of their neighborhood. How does the city expect to take ownership? How does the city expect me to take ownership of my neighborhood when they have excluded me and my neighborhood from the plan 2030? This city is taking ownership, this city is not taking ownership of its own socially, economically, and educationally ill communities, which it has created strictly for the 98% blacks who make up all of the city's housing project by excluding them from the plan. And then I'm going to conclude right here. In conclusion, there may be a state or federal mandate pushing for the expedience of an extensive, comprehensive plan for Norfolk. But this plan needs to be delayed for another six months to include the input of those who have been excluded, unless the city just plans to discriminate against those who have been excluded from the Norfolk plan. Thank In you, other Mr. words, Mr. Robinson. how can you plan, how can you Mr. Robinson. A plan without us unless you plan to oust us? Thank you. Martin Thomas, Jr. Martin Thomas, Jr., 7400 Colony Point Road, Ward's Corner. Mm -hmm. um, here I'm, rep I'm representing the Planning Commission. I want to thank you all for taking up our new plan, Norfolk. Uh, this plan started well before my appointment to the Planning Commission almost three years ago. Um, about half of the plan had been drafted at that point. I've got to give a lot of credit to the planning staff, Frank Duke, for a lot of the hard work that they did, for the commissioners who uh, sat and worked on this plan well before I was appointed. Uh, I can tell you that they worked very hard. Um, in fact, all the commissioners worked very hard as well. We attended six public hearings that were located throughout this city. Everyone had an opportunity to be included. Everyone gave us uh, input. We had pages upon pages of spreadsheets with comments that we included. We tweaked the plan month after month. Uh, I, I can tell you I'm very proud uh, to have worked on this plan. I think it's going to provide us um, guidance for the future. Uh, one, particular, um, one particular part of it that I, I would like to point out as an example of how this is going to guide us. Uh, during one of the planning sessions, uh, a comment was received from a citizen, uh, someone who lived in Park Place, and they suggested that we somehow try to connect the 21st Street cor corridor with Park Place. And it was suggested, I don't remember who, whether it was staff or citizens, but it came out that we should have a commercial corridor on Colonial Avenue that would connect Park Place and 21st Street so that people would have a road that wasn't so industrial to allow you to walk back and forth, maybe have shops and restaurants. And that's beginning to happen. And it's actually pretty exciting. If you've been down there, you know that the Chop House has opened up. And very recently, there's a place called the Handsome Biscuit that's opened up. It's another great local restaurant that you should check out. Um, that's, this plan is going to allow the Planning Commission and the City Council to see that vision, and when applications come before us, uh, hopefully act accordingly to enable that commercial corridor to become a reality. Um, I want to thank you again. I want to thank everybody who was involved. Uh, Frank, I've got to give you a whole lot of credit. Um, Earl and I have agreed that we're going to take you out and buy you a growler later on tonight. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Martin. I am a what? Robert Cox. Growler? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
Beer and a Vice Mayor, uh, members of the City Council, I'd like to thank you again for your service to our city. I'm a uh, resident of Norfolk, 765 West 48th Street, an avid boater. Uh, I'd like to dispel the idea that if you don't wear a green T-shirt, uh, that you're not uh, avidly uh, concerned about the environment. Um, I, I, we received the briefing, as Mr. Squicherini noted, uh, about a week ago. It was sponsored by the Elizabeth River Project and the members of the City of uh, Norfolk staff. Let's just focus on one point. For the Lafayette River, 99%, these are not boaters' figures, these are the figures presented by the Elizabeth River Project and those folks that came together for this, uh, for this forum. 99% of the pollutants in the Lafayette River are made up of three things. And the numbers are 52, uh, correction, 42% are made up of animal waste. This is large animal waste, dogs essentially. 3% of the pollutants are made up of wildlife, wildlife excrement. 54% is made up of runoff. Note, there's nothing in there about boats in that 99% of the pollutants being attributed to the Lafayette River. Norfolk, as you know, is a large city. 56% of Norfolk is land. 44% is water. And I'm not lecturing you. You all know these figures probably much better than I do. But the Lafayette River is a watershed. It's not just the body of water itself. The watershed, which includes vast neighborhoods in Norfolk, many of whom are simply disconnected by distance. Folks that live there don't really think much about the Lafayette River, and they may not think much about the impact that they may have in their daily lives on the Lafayette River water quality. I, I commend uh, Mr. Duke for uh, suggesting his amendment. I agree with it. I agree with, your, uh, with the 2030 uh, plan. I think it's a good plan, with the exception of the no discharge zone. If you were to take all of the boats in the Norfolk Yacht and Country Club, generally pretty smart folks there, I would contend, higher level types of boats, good systems on board. If you were to take all of those boats and you were to take them out of the river. Just take them, take them out. And then you could go to Knitting Mill Creek, the other largest concentration of boats on the Lafayette, and you were to remove them from the water. You would make no impact on the water quality of the Lafayette River. So I commend you to strike the requirement for the no discharge zone uh, in, this, uh, in this plan. Thank you. Thank you very much. Marjorie Jackson. Hi, I'm Marjorie Mayfield Jackson. I live at 1747 Tate Terrace, and I'm here representing the Elizabeth River Project. And um, I want to say first that we're delighted that the draft plan reflects so many of the key goals and strategies that we outlined together with the city in our plan for restoring the Lafayette River. That river is coming back, and it's very exciting to see the progress. Um, we really appreciate the, the city planning staff's um, strengthened focus on environmental stewardship and the planning commission, uh, especially in Chapter 6. You have now meaningful metrics for enhanced water quality. We like that you have the stormwater master plan of support, the commitment to uh, ex increase the extent of natural areas along the waterfront, animal waste cleanup stations, improving water quality, tree canopy cover, all great things. Um, and we appreciate the commitment to work with our River Star Homes program. Um, we do want to clarify how the Elizabeth River Project's position um, does differ from the draft plan in regard to that no discharge zone everybody's talking about. Um, our plan for the Lafayette River, which was developed by community consensus, stated only that a forum should be held for boaters to consider whether a no discharge zone is appropriate, and this was for the Lafayette only, not the entire Elizabeth River. 
And to implement that part of the plan, we have held two professionally facilitated voter forums to consider the topic. It is rather polarized. The last one was March 18th, and there was general support across the, the uh, gathering for a task force with the charge to improve voter education and enforcement regarding existing laws that prohibit the dumping of untreated boat sewage in the Lafayette, make pump out of voter sewage easy and accessible year round on the Lafayette. There was strong interest in finding funding for HRSD to expand their program for voter pump out that they have on the Lynn Haven to the Lafayette and try to establish verifiable metrics about the impacts. You've heard some figures tonight, and I, I really think it's not quite clear what the impact is from, from voter discharges. Anyway, we support this approach with the understanding that a no discharge zone should still be considered if no significant progress is made with that charge in a reasonable amount of time. Now, we make no recommendation regarding whether a no discharge zone is appropriate for the entire Elizabeth River. That's a policy decision that needs further research and discussion of appropriateness and practicality with stakeholder groups, regulators, and the other cities on the Elizabeth. Thank you. Thank you. And what was your name? I'm, I apologize. Oh, sorry. Marjorie Mayfield Jackson. Thank you, ma'am. Earl Fraley. Mr. Vice Mayor, members of council. My name is Earl P. Fraley, Jr., and I reside at 6325 Glen Oak Drive in Norfolk, and I'm the member, of the, uh, chairman of the Planning Commission, and I've come before you this evening to uh, ask you to support our plan, Norfolk, as presented. Um, I'm enormously pleased and gratified to have had the privilege of being at the forefront of um, this plan from the very beginning. Uh, over the last three or four years, We've been working with staff to try to bring this plan together to try to capture a vision of our city going forward and how we can use this as a broad roadmap to our land use decisions. Uh, we want to thank you for your guidance. Uh, you've given us a, a reasonably clear roadmap that we could follow to bring something meaningful before you that you could act on, hopefully, and would also express uh, your aspirations and vision for the city. Um, we are awful grateful as well for the many citizens who chose to um, provide us with some input with regard to how they foresaw our city evolving over the years uh, and enormously pleased uh, with my fellow commissioners. And if you allow me, Mr. Vice Mayor, I'd like to ask them to stand so that we could acknowledge their contributions as well uh, in working with our efforts to bring this to fruition. I do want to take a moment, too, to note uh, our former commissioner, Mr. Mark Warlick, played a very major role in this uh, presentation and pulling this together, as did our former vice chair, uh, Ms. Sybil Stone, who I think is here with us this evening as well. Uh, we are appreciative that uh, we have seen this exercise. Uh, I can recall from graduate school reading many, many uh, chapters and exercises about a comprehensive plan. Uh, to have been a part of one from beginning to hopefully nearing an end. Uh, it is uh, really a gratification that uh, in civic in the civic exercise that I thought I would never experience. Thank you for that opportunity, and I trust your judgment will continue to prevail and provide leadership as we go forward. Thank you. Thank you. Philip Hawkins. Good evening, Vice Mayor Burford, members of Norfolk City Council, City Manager Marcus Jones. My name is Philip Hawkins, Jr., and I reside at 3597 Mississippi Avenue, City of Norfolk, and tonight I'm here to express my thoughts about the proposed 20-year plan, Plan Norfolk 2030. Um, I was previously here a few months ago, but there was some confusion on the items that were on the agenda for that night. I wanted to speak about the decision about the mayor's um, shifting of the voting. So I wanted to come back and clarify and amplify my thoughts and position on this comprehensive plan because it's very important for our citizens now and for future generations to come. 
before planning the city's future as leaders and as community members, we must first understand what the facts are of our past so that we will learn from them to make prudent financial decisions that will benefit the citizens in our city. So this plan is just that. It's just paper. It is not real until we take action on it. So that is so important for us to recognize that first and foremost. So tonight I'm asking for the City Council and Planning Commission to continue to work together um, and also engage our citizens and our community leaders to fulfill the promises that were made for many years to improve all of our communities in Norfolk. Today there are many communities in Norfolk that are still struggling to reach a milestone where they can be truly viewed as a neighborhood of choice. Um, I do want to thank um, the Planning Commission and Planning Development Department um, for adding lifelong learning to the list of priorities for our city. I am a school teacher in Norfolk Public Schools and teaching is my passion. I enjoy what I do. I, I'm a 16 year teaching veteran and I'm not in it for the money, but I still have to live. So I appreciate making that a higher priority on your list of um, initiatives for our city. But until, in terms of our public schools, until Norfolk makes the decision to make schools and education the highest priority in our government, we will continue to see our system struggle to regain our position in the region, both nationally and globally. A world-class education and good-paying jobs and careers go hand in hand. Industry will not locate here in Norfolk until we get this issue right. While I support fully funding our schools at this time, while our economy is still fragile, I will not support a, a real estate tax increase, which I've been hearing two cents for the schools, unless we know where that money is specifically going to go and it's protected in, under ordinance. Um, because we know the general fund, the money may be taken away on any given fiscal year. So if we can find money to pay for new hotels and conference centers like, and renovations like Chrysler Hall and Scope, facilities around the city while our schools are falling apart, I think we certainly should be able to find more money and dig deeper for our schools and for our children in Norfolk Public Schools. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Hawkins. Um, can I conclude? I would like to conclude. <laughs> Mr. Hawkins, you've switched to another issue. That's okay. I, no, this, I think it's still connected. Please, Mr. Hawkins. No, that's okay. I just want, well, I can email it. I can email it email. and I'll copy it to everyone. Thank you. Because um, the neighborhoods, like I said, I, they will be listed. Many on the south side, um, communities related to Norfolk redevelopment have been excluded in this plan. They need to be addressed. Thank, Thank you. you. Joan McEvery? Emory. McEmory. Oh, Emory. Emory. Good evening, Councilman. I'm John McHenry, uh, 523 Fairfax Avenue, and I'm here representing the Ghent Neighborhood League. Before I begin my comments, may I ask for a clarification as to the amendment on the table regarding Yarmouth Street? Frank, could you give her a clarification, please? Just, a cla just clarification on Yarmouth. Yarmouth. The uh, Yarmouth Street is currently shown in the plan, uh, as I believe, as uh, residential mixed, and the proposal is to des it would be to designate that as multifamily corridor, which the plan defines as the townhome district, which is consistent with the prevailing pattern on Yarmouth Street. Thank you. May I ask also for clarification? Would that also include single-family homes? Could we do this all together? <laughs> do you have any other clarifications? Well, without knowing what Ms. No, McKinney I mean, is going to ask. Joan, I can't Joan do you have other clarifications? Uh, technically, what you want is residential mixed in order to be able to, to accommodate both the townhome and the single family. Um, so technically, the residential mixed that it was current, that it was originally proposed, would be the appropriate designation to reflect the existing character of Yarmouth. Okay. No, right. What was the answer that multifamily, Frank, and would, would permit single family? That's a limit and not a floor? It, it, we would treat that as something that could be done under the general plan, but, but uh, I, I would note, as Mr. Hawkins has just said, the plan is not self-executing. And unless you move forward with the ordinances and the actions that are called forward in, which all require additional work, 
nothing would change. So the only way you would be able to deal with that issue would be through zoning ordinance amendments that would deal with the actual uses that could go there. Just one last question of clarification. The current zoning there, is it correct that it is currently zoned single family? <laughs> that is incorrect. It is currently zoned as part of the Ghent Historic District. Okay. All right, thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> Let's go. Let's go. Which I believe is good. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Joan McGannery. I'm here on behalf of the Ghent Neighborhood League. As many of you may have uh, noticed, uh, this kind of hit us as a bit of a surprise. I did check with our president, and she did not get this proposal. Actually, it was just a question came to her. Uh, so in light of that, I'll tell you what our request is, and then perhaps <coughs> if that is not with uh, the will of the council, perhaps we could defer action on any additional changes till we can have an opportunity to vet this through folks who actually live in Yarmouth. Uh, this has been vetted through them. It's, we've been been through this process, and the idea to have this be single family, which is consistent with the Ghent Historic District zoning, which is considered residential, and single family is the only uh, residential use allowed, uh, would be consistent. Um, regarding Yarmouth Street, it is zoned under the Ghent Historic District and zoned as single family, and we believe that it should also be designated single family use. Uh, and any additional changes to that that is in the general plan, we'd appreciate the opportunity to have additional community conversation because I'm sure I'm not the only one that has questions. Also, in our requests, we have requested regarding character district boundaries. We have asked that Hague Towers and Hague Medical Center be reunited with our character district, which includes Eastern Virginia Medical Center, ODU, and Ghent. In addition to the support that you've already heard at different times from neighbors and our neighborhood to support this position, we've also provided you information from the SL Nussbaum website in which the Hague Medical Center is identified as being in the submarket of ODU Ghent. We have also proposed that Norfolk look for a share, fair share program, much like New York City, for community and social services. And we also understand and appreciate the city council members have already clarified and confirmed that nothing in the plan would or could allow commercial and mixed uses to expand into the various residential areas in Ghent. And we simply ask that that would be included in a brief memorializing statement within the Greater Ghent Plan. Also embedded in the general plan is a proposed shift on land use policy away from the use of density to an entirely new and apparently unproven method of land use categories. We've all heard so many times from the city manager, a well-managed government is one that is data driven. As such, we ask planning officials a simple question, the source and standards of these changes, what the source and standards of the changes were modeled from and the localities where they've been successfully utilized. In response, we were told there was no handy reference that could be provided, and since we received no other information, we are generally concerned that it now seems apparent <coughs> the proposed new land use scheme is not based on best practices or any proven track record of success, but is seerly, simply experimental. Thank you very much for the extra time. Thank you. Uh, that concludes the list of speakers for public hearing one. Let's call the roll, please. Well, wait a second. Oh, wow. yeah. There's a lot of yeah. discussion. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, how, I, I really think, Mr. Pishko, how do we wish to handle some of the, uh, uh, there's uh, at least two discussions on amendments uh, and two, um, I have questions on where they fit in. So uh, I guess the general questions of where two topics fit in would probably be more appropriate at this time. And then uh, discussion on the amendments uh, would be later. Would that be correct? Or how, what, what is the... That sounds sensible. Okay. Uh, with regard, to if, 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 how would you wish to do it, Mr. President? Um, well, I would like to call the roll, and then as we move through them, you... Well, I have two that are not mentioned, so it's a different... A good example is Talbot Hall. I mean, that was a classic example of... Uh, in fact, Dr. Whitley and I were talking about Tablet Hall, uh, Tablet Hall before the meeting today, so I'm curious where this fits in. I went and quickly pulled up... Frank, the please... Frank, where would it fit in? I pulled up Chapter 10, um, and uh, Mr. O'Brien makes a great point. Uh, however, when I read Chapter 10, it really is not super specific, and I understand how this works, and uh, I have an idea, uh, but it, Talbot, Talbot Hall is a significant uh, future issue with regard to the city and uh, with regard to uh, even closer to the neighborhood there. Uh, it does have a tremendous amount of history, but we're not naming individual uh, 
houses per se, museums per se, at least what I looked through uh, in chapter 10. That's correct, because right now the zoning ordinance does not give us that ability. So the language that would address Talbot Hall is the language that you were, were given, revise the zoning ordinance to provide for designation of local landmarks. Okay, how are we going to, how do we make that jump then into the future? We are okay. already working on zoning ordinance revisions that would be, and, and one of the ones that we have worked on that George Homewood, my assistant director, has been actively working with the Historic and Architectural Preservation Committee on is a complete rewrite of chapter nine of the zoning ordinance. And one of the issues that uh, that committee has recommended is a particular provision that would allow us to designate individual locations, something we don't have right now. So that is already underway through a zoning ordinance change. Right. That being said, now, uh, and this may involve the city attorney, let's assume uh, hypothetically that a contract comes down tomorrow that fits uh, with a certain zoning requirement that's there. I think it was an institutional. Yes. Uh, that being said, uh, if that is something we do not wish to, to go forward with, wh what can we do to, to stop that? If the applicant were, were if the property owner is moving forward with a, uh, a development that would meet the requirements of the zoning ordinance, then we would not have a way to stop it. Okay, then can we move fast on this one? We're moving forward as quickly as we can on this one. Uh, HAPSI is trying to finish their recommendations on Chapter 9. Uh, they've had a public meeting on it. They have discussed it. They have done a preliminary vote. They are trying to finalize everything over the next couple of months to move well, forward. Very let's, let's get this is really, uh, this bothers me because, uh, and I understand where Talbot Hall does fit within that chapter, even though it's not specifically mentioned, as many of our historic right. landmarks are not. But I think that we need to move very quickly on that, and I'd ask that you uh, move on that very quickly to get the, that done. We are moving as quickly as we can and still providing the opportunities for public input and going through all the processes. And it'd be legal. That are required under state law. Okay, I have one other general comment. Uh, Mr. Robinson made a comment uh, involving uh, the African American community. And um, if you could, can, is there anywhere that you can direct us overall with regard to preservation of heritage involving the, the community as a whole? And I, and I say that only because, um, you know, uh, uh, from a personal perspective, um, you know, my, my grandfather came here uh, at a very early age and spent uh, his entire life on Church Street. Uh, what, uh, uh, and uh, my family grew up on Olney Road. What uh, do we have uh, that we can, uh, with regard to preservation, of what he's talking for us. What can we refer to within the plan? Uh, within the plan, you've, you've got the same issues about uh, trying to enhance the preservation of historic resources, and we are not by any means suggesting that these should just be the history of the more fluent white community, that it does need to reflect all of our histories. Um, there are provisions within the plan to look at how we can better update our, his, our inventory of historic resources. That has not been updated in years. It is woefully out of date. Uh, that needs to be done because every day we are losing potential historic resources simply because we haven't updated an inventory of what they are. So, so that begins to be a first step. Identify them. Then look at those that can be protected. And that would, and that would cover that community and others. Correct? It covers all communities, yes, sir. And but that's something that we're planning on doing, and it is in the plan. Something that the Historic and Architectural Preservation Committee has done. I know when we were looking at adding new Cannonball Trail markers this past year, we made a special outreach into the African American community. I uh, got a few suggestions, not many. I am hoping we will get more. We are moving to try to get some uh, Cannonball Trail markers in the Church Street corridor. It's an issue Mr. Riddick has talked to me about previously, and we know we have resources there that deserve that same marker that, that we place on, on a place like the old city hall that's now the MacArthur Memorial. That just may take a little bit of communication on our part. I agree. Better job with that uh, and better out. All right, those are the two general questions I had. Uh, now, to address specific amendments, how do we wish to handle that? What's the proper formula? As, as we would call, as we move through the docket, you would uh, move to you, you would make the motion. Okay. 
Okay. Well, wait a minute. Wait, then we're gonna. Have I to thought we were voting on the amendments. Well, they were, we're, we're, sure. we separating we're gonna pull the Ghent amendment. That's the only one I think we're. Are we pulling? We're, I think pull it. I think we'll all right. Pull the Ghent amendment. And put the other three in there and. Yeah. And, and vote. On, just vote in block. Okay. Well, let's vote it, uh, Mr. Oh. Mr. Attorney. The, the the motion is to um, eliminate, um, take back out uh, the amendment on Yarmouth, and so that. Um, the initial draft had it as mixed residential, and in the informal session, we had uh, 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 proposed for you to vote on it becoming multifamily quarter. quarter. So what you'll be voting on it is uh, Yarmouth as mixed res residential, uh, the changes to Norview that were given to you, the no discharge zone language that was given to you, and the lifelong learning. So it'll be um, the... Uh, 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 Original draft plus those three amendments is what you're voting on. So okay. Yarmouth is still in? No. It, it's not in it's as... Out. It's out what it was originally. The change is out. And if there's a change, it will be amended later. All right. Because and the so no discharge zone... I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Paul. The no, no discharge zone is still in as a no discharge zone? It is with this language, and I think it, it is what everybody was asking, so I think you have a lot of common ground here. It's work with community partners to explore potential designation of Norfolk's waterways as no discharge zone. And so it's a, 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 a exploration expression mm -hmm. uh, is the language that uh, you had given to you in the informal session. So, so what happens? So voters would have the ability to discharge or they don't? It, it does not change the status quo. It leaves to a future time for this council to take up the question. And the planning uh, department is recommending that they meet with the stakeholders. Mm -hmm. I think that's what the Elizabeth River Group is recommending. Mm -hmm. So that prior to that question being brought back to you, there will be more work. And it, it's a question that will be, it's not being proposed to be answered tonight. Tonight is just let's plan to take it up later. Is there no discharge zone now? Is that still in the there, there are laws about <coughs> discharge there yeah. that they're not I mean, even being enforced. I mean, we're not we got these letters from the no, voting community, but are we changing it? Are we sticking with the no discharge zone? That's what I'm... It, well, we're doing status quo. It's, it's just a, a wording. It's a wording of working together to achieve what's reasonable. Yes, as Dr. Willie says, the status quo does not change, mm -hmm. and the proposal is for us to explore and bring something back to you later on that question. So I guess Mr. Riddick's question would be, what is it now? Is that what you're asking, Mr. Yeah. Riddick? What is it? What is the status quo? I, I believe that all we have is the, the federal laws, and I, and I think that as they were presented to you tonight, those are pretty accurate that you can, you, you, you cannot charge uh, untreated, that you've got to get your sewage to uh, a, a much improved level, and, and that um, the representation tonight was that it's relatively minor. So that right now, it's the federal, it is the Clean Water Act that is governing it. Uh, on discharge is the answer to the question. Mm -hmm. It's the only law that I know of pertaining to it. So the, the Planning Commission put in the caveat about the no discharge zone? Yes. Okay. I think we personally, you know, while I trust the members of the boating community and probably, uh, they're probably responsible, but I believe that we should keep the no discharge zone. Uh, if not, 10 years from now, we or our successors might regret it. So I think we need to keep that in. Well, why don't we just separate that language and vote on it separate from the rest of the plan? Vote on the That'd two be. and the general plan and the two and then vote on that separate. I think we may as well just I don't separate think any all. effort to discourage no clean rivers. I just think they want to get at it at, a, at work. And mechanically, some of it doesn't work. And, the, and, it, and it's not, uh, you know, it's not feasible in some cases. And, and But I think the biggest issue now is enforcing the laws they already have. I don't think anybody enforces them at all. I could be wrong. But, but Why it's, don't but, we just vote on them all separately? <coughs> call it a day. No, we don't need to vote on them separately. Okay. I think we need to vote on them in a block. It does open the conversation, again, Mr. Reddick, for yeah. uh, us to begin that conversation with the voters. But okay. I think that, you know, uh, thus far, uh, they've been responsible. So that just to get us moving in the right direction. Okay. okay. Well, let's vote on it in a block. So let's call it. The only thing room. I will ask is if, if we are going to have a commu community discussion on what's going to happen with this dis no discharge zone, I'm a little confused on if there's no, what exactly is being discharged, but I guess that's for another day. Um, I would like that to be reported back to us because I, I would hope that we're going to keep an eye on this. Yes. And it also needs to include 
boaters from all parts of Norfolk, not just the Lafayette River. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Well, can I can we ask Frank a question on this particular issue? She's one more Frank, question. Frank, you... Frank, why don't you just sit up here in the front? Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, and I appreciate it because I, I, I think it's an important issue, and I, and I, and I respect what Ms. Mayfield Jackson said. That's why I asked what her, her name was. It, it seems that what she's saying is the discussion's already begun as to what's already in the plan. It, I would think, though, when I'm thinking of discharge at the Lafayette, I'm thinking at the mouth of the Lafayette, I'm thinking of, of VIT. The discharge... Uh, a no discharge done would be dealing with the entire body of the Lafayette River. What we're proposing, the, the change, is exactly the language uh, that Marjorie indicated the Lafayette River project is already pursuing. She said that was the one difference was what was in the plan and, and what there is in their plan. So what we're actually doing is coming with the language I've proposed to you would be to bring our plan into further com uh, conformity with what the Lafayette River Project has suggested. As, as long as it's in conformity with that and it's understood by, and, and it seems the boaters are doing what they're supposed to do. Uh, and I don't see a lot of that coming from our recreational boaters. My issue is, is I see it coming from what may be coming out of at, at VIT or NIT. And I, I would not disagree having worked in water resource management that a significant number of the contaminants getting into the water are coming from stormwater runoff, coming off of yards, coming off of pet waste, animal waste. Um, so I would not disagree with the, broadly speaking, with the numbers that you were given earlier today. So if we vote for this amendment, it's to continue the discussion to get to a perfect place. We need a better understanding of the nature of all of the contaminants so that we can address all of the contaminants that are currently getting into the rivers. Um, and if we discover through the course of that effort and the course of discussions with all the affected parties that it is coming from the boating community, then we should be looking to go after a more stringent regulation. Okay. Uh, and then um, back to Yarmouth, I believe it was asked that it should be single family. It is not single family now. The current amendment is to make it what? The current ordinance, it would, what you had in front of you, because uh, would be to leave it as residential mixed, right. which is expressly intended to address those areas of the city where you have no real prevailing land use pattern, which is, we, and when the Planning Commission looked at Yarmouth, they looked at that block and said it is a mix of about two-thirds townhome and one-third a single family which I confirmed that this afternoon, which is why the Planning Commission recommended it be, sing it be residential mixed, but no single form controls. But residential mixed, does that mean at some point that it becomes an apartment? No. In order to become an apartment, it would have to go through a whole series of revisions, uh, and frankly, none of the parcels in that area have anywhere near the capacity to address ordinance requirements for an apartment. All right. Thank you, Frank. All righty. Thank you for indulging me. No problem. Mr. Clerk, please call the roll. Dispense with the charter requirement for reading the ordinance as amended and adopt. Mr. Burfitt? Aye. Mr. Protegiro? If I could ask, Dr. Wibley, your understanding of that, you're comfortable with... Uh, with I have absolutely no understanding of it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I am totally confused. And so am I. So you guys hash it out. <laughs> so I'm pushing I'm it over to you. I, you know, as Frank... I, you know, I am comfortable in voting for this now with the idea that it, with further discussion, it can be amended later. Okay. I, I, My compromise met with um, a resounding confusion, so I, I'll vote for this. Well, I, then uh, before I vote, I want to be understood. I am more inclined to a more restrictive request that has been brought before us today. I understand it is not here. I, can, I am not inclined to vote no to these because of that, but it seems to be a compromise, and you know the issue much better than I do. That's why I asked. Uh, however, I do believe that uh, I'm more inclined at some point on Yarmouth that we look uh, closer and make it as tight as possible, uh, as it's been requested by the residents there. Uh, that being said, and for the other issues that I've raised uh, in discussion, um, uh, I vote aye. Mr. Riddick? Okay. Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to vote aye as well, but... I would like to point out that, in my opinion, Mr. Robinson is exactly correct uh, in regards to our apparent exclusion of our public housing residents. Quite often, uh, our public housing communities are overlooked until it's time for them to be dis demolished. And uh, like Mr. Progero, I won't vote no simply because of this particular 
uh, aspect was pointed out uh, quite clearly. And uh, I just hope that although we're adopting this uh, 2030 plan, that we can uh, incorporate from our body here these public housing communities in terms of their uh, uh, being a great part of the city of Norfolk. Yes. How about that? Mr. Smeagle? Yeah, I wanted to thank the Planning Commission for their leadership and hard work with this, but particularly um, Sybil Stone and Martin Thomas, um, who took the time when this was being discussed to meet with community leaders down in Ward 5 to make sure <coughs> that their concerns were met. Um, in addition, I'll thank them later also for the East Beach Harbor Zoning. Um, and also to thank the Planning Commission too, because the, there was so much flexibility with this uh, in discussion. I know that um, the Ward 5 Advisory Committee, we got together and we went through the plan and there was an area of concern along the Little Creek Road area that was completely left out of the plan. And those citizens put together a plan and it was presented to the Planning Commission and they adopted it. They took the time to draft language, put it together, um, and you accepted it without any question. And so there was true citizen input in, in this um, with your outreach efforts as well as allowing the opportunity for citizens to make suggestions. In fact, I believe this should have been voted on a long time ago, that we've delayed it for too long, um, mainly because we've allowed other input into it. Um, so it is a living and breathing document, um, as Frank has told us. Um, for the next 20 years, it could be amended, it can be changed, um, it, it probably will be. And so I encourage citizens to continue looking through it. And if you find areas that need to be adjusted, bring it to the Planning Commission and they will, uh, um, uh, they will adjust it. They'll make those changes. Um, so I, I'm very proud to vote aye on this. Dr. Wibley? I would also like to thank everybody, including Frank Duke and, and the whole Planning Commission. We obviously don't pay you all enough. Right, Mr. Uh, don't don't yeah. pay him anything. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> He's your best supporter on that. If he had it, you'd have a payroll paycheck. Aye. Ms. Williams? Um, I would like to take the opportunity to thank everybody um, who participated in all of the outreach sessions that were made to the community, um, as well as the staff who spent time and put this together, and the planning commission who is not paid and spent their time um, away from their family, away from their respective businesses to um, in sacrifice to, to their city. And I would also like to say that um, I too would like to see uh, Mr. Mr. Robinson does bring up a good point as he most often does when he speaks before council. He always says something that makes us go, hmm, I think he's right. So I would, I would also like to see um, a place for um, some of the historic landmarks and some of the historic African-American communities addressed as well as um, our public uh, housing communities in terms of making those areas more vibrant um, for its residents. And and uh, to piggyback off of what I think it was um, Councilman Smeagle said, you know, go through the plan, look through the plan. Um, if you find discrepancies, uh, please, by all means, do send it to the Planning Commission. But send it to us as well um, because uh, I'd like to see what your ideas are. I'm very interested in how people perceive things and how they, the different perspectives um, that come from a community that is as diverse as ours. So uh, while you not only contact your planning commissioner or contact Mr. Duke, um, please feel free to email me and the rest of the council um, your ideas and uh, we will work to incorporate them in this living, breathing plan um, for the next 20 years. And with that, I vote aye. Mr. Wynn. Well, I won't repeat my mm -hmm. thanks, but you know, the past and present commissioners could have to take some uh, comfort in the fact that they will term off the commission before they have to go through this exercise. <laughs> uh, I know you've heard every position from every angle, and, and I really appreciate your patience, and thank you for your good work. I would I. Okay. Thank you to the Planning Commission. Uh, public hearing two, please. Public hearing two scheduled for this day pursuant to action of council on February 26 on the application of Champion Fence for a change of zoning to change the conditions on property zone conditional C2 on property located at 3515 Colonial Avenue. And by 6 0 vote, Planning Commission recommends approval. Okay, we had Rob and Thomas here to answer any questions. Okay. Fence. 
Okay, I have an, or, or an ordinance to rezone property located at 3515 Colonial Avenue in order to change conditions on property zone conditional C2. Dispense with the charter requirement for reading the ordinance and adopt. Mr. Burfitt? Aye. Mr. Protegiro? Aye. Mr. Riddick? Aye. Mr. Smigel? Aye. Dr. Webley? Aye. Ms. Williams? Aye. Mr. Wynn? Aye. Uh, public hearing three, please. Public hearing three scheduled for this day pursuant to action of council on February 26, 2013 on the application of the City Planning Commission to amend the zoning ordinance of the City of Norfolk 1992 on a text amendment to repeal section 10-10 and reordain the East Beach Harbor District and by a 5-1 vote Planning Commission recommends approval. Okay, we have two people signed up to speak. John Harris. Is John Harris. Reported. <coughs> 12 meetings. Good evening, Vice Mayor uh, and members of the council. My name is John Harris. I, I live at 3840 Bay Oaks Place, City of Norfolk. I am uh, I'm here to uh, support this zoning, uh, although there was one uh, item that did uh, appear at the last minute where they took out the permitted use of hotel, motel in that area. Uh, it, Ocean View has a history. Uh, actually was the very first resort in the United States. And uh, over the last 20 years, we've taken out most of those options as far as nice hotels, uh, uh, places for people to come as far as tourists and visitors. Most everyone's been coming into the downtown Norfolk area, and that's where we have put all the hotels and motels. Uh, I'm here to ask uh, that you put back in that permitted use along that harbor front property. Uh, it's, to me, uh, East Beach has won many, many uh, awards for its community. It's also becoming a destination. Uh, it's, a, it's a community effort to help improve the Marines in there and to also bring in tourists, to bring in uh, larger vessels. Uh, but there's no real place for anybody to stay of any quality that's in that area. There's no place for people to come visit. I have a small parcel. I'm a landowner. I've been in there way before <laughs> East Beach was East Beach. And it had always been a vision of mine and other small landowners in there to promote the community and provide a means for ourselves to make a living and also to help bring in the tourist business back into the city of Norfolk and our ocean view beaches. I've uh, traveled to many locations uh, with the Ray Gendros when we went through the whole process. We bought into the concept, participated in all of that. Uh, in the end, we bought the dream, but the, the method of being able to enact those zoning requirements just wasn't there. Uh, this new zoning does permit it, and I think it's a big difference, and I, hopefully we're going to see something take place with both the existing businesses and those that haven't started one. Uh, as a member of the Builders Guild in East Beach, uh, we went to many places to see how those developments were working, which consisted of Ion, Watercolor, Seaside, uh, Habersham, uh, Celebration, and in all those places, uh, they, they had a way of accommodating visitors. They want visitors. People like us to go there so we can bring it back home and, and build it in our own locations. Therefore, I am just asking uh, if you would consider putting that use as a permitted use instead of a special uh, use permit process. We already have to go through the, uh, the certificate. Thank you, Joe. Thank you so much. Kim Benassi. Hello, I'm Ken Benassi. I live at 95, uh, 81, <clears throat> 26 Bay. I want to uh, encourage you to vote for this ordinance. There was uh, this was a lot of give and take from a lot of people. George Homewood, Sybil Stone, many people worked very hard on this. A couple of councilmen here really stood up and did some heavy lifting for us. So we think it's a good compromise. We didn't get everything we wanted. We have a, an apartment complex with uh, 71 units per acre moving into our neighborhood. That's, that's not good. But you, you, you all fixed it, and this is part of the fix. So. 
Thank you, Ken. Okay, call the roll. Dispense with the charter requirement for reading the ordinance and adopt. Mr. Burfitt? Aye. Mr. Protogero? Aye. Mr. Riddick? Aye. Mr. Smeagol? Aye. Dr. Wibley? Aye. Ms. Williams? Aye. Mr. Wynn? Aye. Public hearing four has been rescheduled. Yes, sir. There's been a request to um, continue this item, Mr. President, from the applicant. Oh. And I believe the date that had been discussed was April 23. Yes. Okay, so the motion would be to continue the, the public hearing to April the 23rd. Mr. Burfitt? Aye. Mr. Protogero? Aye. Mr. Riddick? Aye. Mr. Smeagol? Aye. Dr. Wibley? Aye. Mr. Williams? Aye. Mr. Wynn? Aye. Okay, the consent agenda. Yeah. Approve the consent agenda, Mr. Burfitt? Aye. Mr. Protogero? Aye. Mr. Riddick? Aye. Mr. Smeagol? Aye. Dr. Wibley? Aye. Ms. Williams? Aye. Mr. Wynn? Aye. At R1. R1 is an ordinance granting a special exception to operate an entertainment establishment on property located at 9575 Shore Drive. By 5 2 vote, Planning Commission uh, recommends approval. We have Al Zuhora to answer any questions if there are any. If not, call the roll. Dispense. Who, who were the two now? I don't this specifies, August. Mr. Protogero. <laughs> he told us last night. We have. It's fairly long. I wasn't here. Yeah. Um, the negative votes were cast by Mr. Law and Mr. Fraley. Okay. Yeah. Call the roll. Dispense with the charter requirement for reading the ordinance and adopt. Mr. Burfitt? Aye. Mr. Protogero? Aye. Mr. Riddick? Aye. Mr. Smeagol? Just wanted to say that the... Um, community has been discussing this since the uh, issue with Mojo Bones came up. Uh, each Civic League was asked to take a position on, on the special exception in Ward 5. And of the 17 Civic Leagues, um, 14, I have been quoting 15, but 14 of the 17 Civic Leagues were responded with allowing Ward 5 to be able to go till 2 a.m. I think it's important um, to any operator who comes in that they understand that the community around there, as any community in Norfolk, is precious, and we have high expectations for you as an operator and making sure that we keep the standards of the community um, together, and we appreciate you taking that investment in, in the area. The East Ocean View Civic League, uh, which had over 60 members present um, at the meeting with, with this, when this was discussed, voted unanimously to support AJ Gators um, and their investment in East Ocean View. Aye. Dr. Wibley? Aye. Ms. Williams? Aye. Mr. Wynn? Well, I have mixed emotions, as most of you know, about this, this issue. Uh, we just granted 1 o'clock to, Mo to uh, yeah, Mojo Bones. Um, I think we're still fragile down there. I think we ought to be consistent. And, and if, if we grant this, which we obviously have since it's decided, we ought to let Mojo Bones come back and get 2 o'clock. I think. I think it's still early. I, I know that, that the sentiment is we want everybody to have equal and do everything that everybody else has. And, and, and I understand that. I understand competition. But areas are different, and Ocean View and areas come a long way, and there have been a lot of grandfathered uses that have closed up and, and, and 10 or 15 years ago. It was a, it was a different story. We've, we've done well. A.J. Gators is traditionally a great operator. This is nothing... Uh, I just hope we're not making a mistake here. I think, I think it's a little early in the process. Uh, you know, I, I'm going to vote aye for it, but I think uh, I think we need to. You know, now we go make Mojo, and 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 I hope we haven't. Uh, you know, we worked a long time to bring this in, and uh, uh, you know, it, it's. I'm not sure that the, 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 the rationale is right, but uh, you know, rather than you know, it's already been approved. I, I will vote aye for it. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, R two, please. An ordinance permitting Kellum Galleries to encroach four feet more or less in the right of way at 130 West Alney Road with two awnings. Dispense with the charter requirement for reading the ordinance and adopt. Mr. Burfitt. Aye. Mr. Protogero. Aye. Mr. Riddick? Aye. Mr. Smeagol? Aye. Dr. Wibley? Aye. Ms. Williams? Aye. Mr. Wynn? Aye. R3? An ordinance to repeal three subsections of Section 25-653 and to amend and reordain Sections 25-648, 650, 651, 652, and 654 of the Norfolk City Code 1979. 
so as to add one new right turn prohibition, one new left turn prohibition, one new U-turn prohibition, one new one-way street, and ten new stop intersections. Dispense with the charter requirement for reading the ordinance and adopt. Mr. Burfoot? Aye. Mr. Protegiru? Aye. Mr. Riddick? Aye. Mr. Smeagol? Aye. Dr. Wibley? Aye. Ms. William? Aye. Mr. Wynn? Aye. R4? An ordinance authorizing the purchase from Seth W. Farwell of certain property located at 706 37th Street for the sum of $3,000, authorizing the city manager to negotiate an agreement in substantial conformity with the terms and conditions of the attached purchase and sale agreement, and authorizing the expenditure of the sum of $3,800 from funds heretofore appropriated to pay the purchase price and the other transaction costs. Dispense with the charter requirement for reading the ordinance and adopt. Mr. Burfitt? Aye. Mr. Protegiru? Aye. Mr. Riddick? Aye. Mr. Smeagol? Aye. Dr. Wibley? Aye. Ms. Williams? Aye. Mr. Wynn? Aye. Okay. Go ahead, Mr. President. Okay, that concludes our regular agenda business.